Welcome to the New York City Bar Association podcast. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the City Bar. Thank you for joining the New York City Bar Association podcast. I am Theodora Florent here with my co-host and colleague, Jose Landivar, and we are attorneys and members of the New York City Bar Association's Copyright and Literary Property Committee. On today's show, we will be speaking with Karen A. Temple, Senior Executive Vice President and Global General Counsel for the Motion Picture Association, or MPA. The MPA advocates for the motion picture and television industries with the goals of promoting copyright protection, expanding market access, and curbing copyright infringement, including by way of limiting the sharing of copyright protected works over peer-to-peer file network and streaming from piracy sites. Its members include the Walt Disney Company, Warner Brothers Entertainment, Paramount Pictures, Sony Pictures, Universal Pictures, and Netflix. Before joining the MPA, Ms. Temple served more than eight years in the U.S. Copyright Office, most recently as the United States Register of Copyrights, where she led the 400-person agency and its eight divisions. Before leading the Copyright Office, Ms. Temple held various roles within the Copyright Office, including Acting Register of Copyrights and Associate Register of the Office of Policy and International Affairs. She served in the U.S. Justice Department, as senior counsel to the deputy attorney of the United States during the Obama administration. She was the vice president of litigation and legal affairs for the Recording Industry Association of America. Karen also spent several years as a litigation associate at the law firm Williams & Connolly LLP and received her JD from Columbia University School of Law, where she was senior editor of the Columbia Law Review and served as chairperson of the Columbia Black Law Students Association. Ms. Temple has a BA in English from the University of Michigan. We are excited to have Karen on today's show to discuss the MPA's global efforts to combat online piracy and to hear her thoughts on some of the major copyright issues facing the film, television, and streaming industries today. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here today. Karen, to start, can you share what led you to copyright law and why you decided to pursue it? Is there a particular work of art or experience that led you to the practice? I would say like a lot of IP lawyers, I kind of count myself as a failed creative in some sense. I was an English major in undergrad, really interested in literature, loved literature, loved reading. I actually started my first book in high school. It was a mystery uh, novel, but I only finished one chapter uh, because I was not ever able to actually completed, I realized that although I loved literature and um, loved reading, yeah, probably was not going to have a career as an author, but I wanted to be as close as possible to creators and authors. And so I did decide to go to law school. And as part of my law school journey, I really wanted to see, is there a way to combine my interest in the law as well as my interest in creativity And I think being a copyright lawyer, working with creators, working to protect creator rights kind of is that sweet spot for me in terms of having both the legal side, but also being close to creators and being able to support them in their careers as artists. As a follow up, did you often find yourself gravitating towards representing clients who were artists with respect to books? Or was it just more of a gamut of anyone in the arts? It was more of broadly anyone in the arts. When I started off, obviously, as most young lawyers, I was doing a lot of different things. So from contracts to employment law. And but I always knew that I really wanted to, again, get into this IP space and I was ready to do it in any way I could. And it wasn't really until I was able to go to the Recording Industry Association of America where I was able to really focus kind of 24-7 on copyright law. So I started off, obviously, in the music industry because that was where I kind of really had my first job focused exclusively on copyright law. Then, of course, going to the copyright office itself, I was able to help support creators of all types, not just the music industry. And now kind of I've gone come full circle and I'm able to be in the movie industry and support creators from the film side. So it's always just been an interest of mine to be able to be in that space, in that creative space, whether it is literature, film, art. I find it all fascinating. Can we dive a little bit into 
how you were able to leverage those skills from the recording industry of America to bringing those skills with you to the U.S. Copyright Office. And we do have to say that this is really an incredible treat for us because on our first episode, we were first, we were privileged to have both the current Register of Copyrights, Shira Perlmutter, and former Register Maria Palante to discuss the legacy of the late Mary Beth Peters. And of course, we know that you served as Register of Copyrights where you led the agency and you served as Register from 2016 to 2020 and oversaw the continued modernization of the Copyright Office and the implementation of the Music Modernization Act of 2018. So I'm just curious as to whether you can share with us how you were able to bring those skills from your first role to the Copyright Office. I would say that I was at the RIAA during a really exciting time for copyright law. This was uh, exciting and scary, probably, because this was the dawn of the Internet, Napster, and all of those new services. And the recording industry, all of the industries were trying to figure out how to deal with the issue of uh, online piracy, which right. was a new issue that we were also trying to not only deal with online piracy, but also figure out how to develop legitimate um, services online as well, because consumers did certainly want to be able to get access to creative works. And so I think being able to grow up as a copyright lawyer during that time where we were in the process of really still developing the law, Rockster came down, the Rockster case, which is one of the biggest cases that developed the inducement standard of of in, infringement I came down while I was at the RIAA. I was able to attend the Supreme Court hearing on that case. And so that really allowed me to, again, immerse myself into copyright law and to, into developing copyright law because we were at the forefront of that development in terms of the music industry. So I was able to carry that with me when I came to the Copyright Office and was switching more from not the litigation side, but the policy side. And so I was able to use things that I learned as a litigator in this space to help me as I was dealing with kind of the development of the laws in the first instance by going to the Office of Policy and International Affairs at the U.S. Copyright Office. So I, I thought that it was great training for me, understanding how industries are going to want to apply the laws that are being developed. That was very helpful as I was helping Congress to develop the copyright laws while I was at the U.S. Copyright Office. That's incredible. What would you say you were especially proud of in terms of the, the policies that you were able to implement in terms of the outcomes or any achievements under your tenure? I would say that, you know, it was really just an exciting opportunity to serve as the head of the U.S. Copyright Office. If you had asked me before I went to the Copyright Office as a young lawyer, whether I had that as a goal, I would have never imagined myself in millions of years, in a million years running the Copyright Office. I started out as a senior counsel in the Office of Policy and International Affairs, then went on to um, run that department as an associate register before I was appointed as a register. So that, it was really just amazing to me that I was in that position. I would say what, one of the things that I, or a couple of things I really was proud about during my tenure is to focus on the kind of day-to-day -day operational work of the office. So certainly I came from the policy side, really intrigued by the policy issues that the Copyright Office has to confront and develop. But the office itself on a day-to-day -day basis affects creators of all you know, types because that's where they go to get their registrations. And so I was really uh, proud about focusing on some of the operational needs of the office. Uh, we were able during my tenure to completely em eliminate what we call the backlog, backlog rather of copyright registration applications. That's sometimes thousands and thousands of applications that are still waiting to be completed so that the authors can get their registrations. We were also able to, over uh, my tenure, reduce claims that had been pending for more than a year by over 90%, because obviously if you're an author, you want to not have your registration pending for multiple years. And then we were able to decrease uh, processing times uh, for registration applications by more than 40% while I was at the office. And again, that has real impact for everyday creators. You can't actually get into court unless you have a copyright registration. And so it's really important that authors are able to quickly and efficiently 
go to the office and get their registration applications to the plan. And so I was really proud that we were able to kind of really focus on, are there things that we need to do better to ensure that process works better for everyday artists who are coming to our office? And I was also kind of proud of some of the fun things that we were able to do just to engage the public. We started an educational video series that we actually recorded while I was there, and then they launched it right after I left. And again, we were always trying to make sure that we were able to reach all aspects of the creative industry, not right. just big offices or big conglomerates. And so providing educational videos, I think, was important. We, I think, at one point might have done a, a quick Google or whatever search about copyright office or the copyright law, and the copyright office didn't come up. And the videos that were on copyright law were not from the copyright office. And so having videos that people could trust really were stating the law as they, as they should, as it should, and, and could be something that an artist could rely on in terms of explaining how the law works, I thought uh, was really important and was really happy to help to develop those educational videos. And then we did stuff like partnering with local libraries to engage on public uh, with the public on copyright law. So we had a partnership where uh, the copyright office would have um, kind of like a, a mini office in, in a public library. So again, we're not waiting for artists to come to us, but we're able to have, go to where the artists might be in their daily library and, el- and help the, to answer questions that artists might have or authors might have as they're trying to fill out copyright registration applications. Oh, that's incredible. So would you say those were more as informal workshops for folks to have just a foundational understanding of what does it entail to to file a copyright right. registration? Exactly. Just answering questions. I mean, we have a the Copyright Office has a great information and education department and folks can call. Um, but sometimes it's important to kind of go out there uh, to the public and, and be where they are so that they know they have access to answering questions as they're trying to fill out their applications. And so I, and I think that's something that they've continued to do with the Copyright Office is to really do a lot more in terms of conferences, meetings, making sure that the public understands that the Copyright Office is accessible to them. I think Shira, the current register, has really focused, I think, on that aspect as well in terms of copyright for all and making sure that the office is accessible. How did you perceive the Copyright Office's role in shaping international policy? And what role do you think it should play with respect to international affairs? Of course, that role is actually specifically set forth in the U.S. Copyright Act under Section 701, which does specifically make the Copyright Office an advisor on international issues and make sure that the Copyright Office can serve on delegations and meetings with foreign governments. As the expert on copyright in the federal government, I think it's important for the Copyright Office to work closely with all of the federal agencies on these issues. I was fortunate during my eight years at the Copyright Office to travel extensively to the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, and actually had the honor of serving on two delegations to diplomatic conferences that actually included two treaties, one being the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise disabled, in short, the Marrakesh Treaty in 2013, and then the Beijing Treaty on Audiovisual Performances in 2012. And that really entails serving as the copyright expert and advisor to the United States government as they're negotiating the treaty language and providing expert advice as to how our law works, how any treaty provisions that the U.S. is considering agreeing to will be implemented in the United States and whether it would conflict with U.S. law. And so those are the types of things that I think that the officer is going to continue to do. I know that they were just at WIPO, I think, a couple of weeks ago because WIPO had its standing committee on copyrights just, I think, two weeks ago, and members of the U.S. Copyright Office were there. So they are key advisors to the United States government on all issues with respect to copyright. Touching upon policy again, I would say during your time as register, and even from your viewpoint now, how would you compare the Copyright Office's role in setting policy with similar agencies in other countries? And I'm also very curious to to learn more about your perspective, being that you served on various committees and association to WIPO. 
And also, do you think that its current approach is effective? Yeah, I think that the Copyright Office in the United States is probably in, uh, in one of the most unique roles because unlike other countries, it is within the Library of Congress. And so one of the things that actually has benefited the Copyright Office from that particular stru structure is that it is very close to Congress. So Congress really does see the Copyright Office as that key technical advisor. And so the Copyright Office is able to help shape and inform legislation on copyright law from the very, very beginning. Staffers and members of Congress can call up and say, I'm thinking of a law on this issue. And they are able, they don't have to go to kind of a formal process or that you have at the USG where one branch is, has to formally engage with another branch because the U.S. Copyright Office is in essentially the legislative branch. You're able to have that back and forth immediately with members and their staff. And that, I think, uh, allows you to, one, develop a really good relationship with those members and staff, but also kind of help steer and make sure that as they are developing legislation, all of the ramifications of potential legislation, all of the consequences, benefits, or harms of potential legislation are thought about at the front end before the legislation is actually closed. And so I think that's that unique relationship with Congress really is different than a lot of the, the ways that other offices, copyright offices around the world operate. Would you say there is a particular country that you would admire, that you often admired with respect to its copyright policy structure and or, or whether you think it would be instructive as a particular case study? I mean, I think that there are other models out there where some copyright offices might be in different ministries within the government. Some offices are completely independent offices, and so they are not within a specific kind of underneath the specific ministry. So there, I think, are pros and cons, really, of each of those models in terms of what works best. I do think that having the direct relationship with Congress is really important. But of course, you want to also make sure that the Copyright Office's independent voice is still able to be heard as well. So I, I know that in the past, there's always been conversations as to are there better models? Are there different models? And we, I think, are just continuing to figure out and work with the office and others as to even within the structure, are there things that we can do to improve the overall functioning of the office? And I think the modernization process that the office has been undergoing for several years is one aspect of that. Irrespective of where the office is located, ensuring that the office has the resources that it needs to be able to be modern, to be able to make sure that the registration process works effectively and quickly for all types of industries and all types of individual creators, I think is key. And sometimes it's difficult in the federal government to get that those resources. So it's always important, I think, to make sure that the office will have the resources it needs to really be able to do what is, a, I think, a huge job of benefit to creator, creators, not only in the United States, but around the world. Incredible. You left such a large stamp uh, during your time at the U.S. Copyright Office, and you are now able to bring your leadership to uh, the Motion Picture Association. Uh, and you're currently senior executive vice president and global general counsel for the MPA, where you oversee all of the association's legal affairs and content protection efforts for its six members, which helps protect them from piracy around the world. And just to help our listeners, could you briefly explain what online, pi online piracy is and how the MPA is looking to stop it? Yeah, I mean, from my view, and I think for the, from the view of a lot of creators, online piracy it really is just another word for stealing. I mean, it really does involve criminal organizations. Often those organizations are located overseas, overseas who steal creative content, and they do so for their own commercial profit. The only difference is that they're not breaking windows and ransacking for storefronts. They are using their computers to steal that content. And these criminals are able to make millions and millions of dollars and even use some of those, some of that revenue, illegal revenue that they generate to fund other criminal activities. So I, I know that some studies have shown, for example, that the U.S. economy has lost nearly $30 billion in a year of lost revenue and more than $200,000 in lost jobs due to piracy. And the way we address it at the MPA is through our organization, the Alliance for Creativity and Entertainment, 
which we like to say is the world's global leading quantum protection coalition uh, that is solely dedicated uh, to com combating digital piracy. And I guess building on that, what specific initiatives or efforts is the MPA uh, focused on in 2024 to stop online piracy? I will say we are continually working to ensure that wherever pirates are, wherever they are located, we're able to work either with our law enforcement in those law enforcement partners in those jurisdictions or do what we call our own self-help with civil litigation or working with intermediaries like payment processors and others to disrupt those. So we are continually, we have a team of uh, nearly 100 staff that work on content protection for us 24-7 and are uh, focused on protecting the, our uh, members' audiovisual content from theft. And we also work, as I said, really closely with law enforcement. So whether that's us just having a, a relationship with law enforcement so they know who to call, they find something and they to have assistance in identifying whether something is illegal or not. And then we also do a lot of criminal referrals. We encourage as well those countries that have not been as effective in enforcement to do better. And we work closely with our partners in the United States government, for example, I like with Special 301 um, and other trade initiatives to ensure that uh, the U.S. trading partners are meeting the, their obligations under various free trade agreements to, to have a certain rule of law with respect to IP protection. So it's something that we really focus on from the policy side from the day-to-day -day operational side as well, just to ensure that we have not only the rule of law in place, but then are able to operationalize and implement those laws in an effective way to combat piracy. We'll never be able to get rid of all piracy, just as I don't think that we'll ever be able to stop all car theft. Okay. But I think that we can be more effective if we are working collaboratively with various countries to ensure that they have strong laws to prevent piracy and also working collaboratively with our partners along the supply and demand chain, like whether it's search engines, social media, or payment processors to di disrupt uh, the illegal activities that are occurring. Do you think the U.S. has enough of a legal framework to sufficiently combat online piracy? Or do you think there are other countries that could be instructional? that have different policies or better policies in place? I'd say historically, the United States has been at the forefront in terms of rule of law and provisions on enforcement. And so we um, it have in the past taken pride on being a leader um, in that. But there are some areas where uh, the, the U.S. has fallen behind other countries. We've Fix some of those gaps. So recently in the last couple of years, we uh, were able to, the U.S. Uh, Congress passed legislation to create felony streaming penalties because in the past, uh, penalties for illegal streaming were actually just misdemeanors. But that was because streaming was, hadn't been a, a, a huge issue. And so it became something that obviously after the development of the Internet, that was how uh, most content was being distributed. And so the House and Senate were able to come together and develop a provisions to address that. The one area that we have not been uh, able to address in the United States yet is on the issue of no-fault injunctive relief. That is a type of relief that is being employed right now in more than 60 countries. And it's something that I actually just testified before the House Judiciary Committee on in uh, December of last year. And it's something that really does prevent pirates from coming in, into the United States by and generating significant revenue from U.S. users. And we are, I think now, since this issue was initially discussed in the United States a while back, and there was some controversy around it, since that has happened again, we now have 60 countries that are use, having various provisions. We have a number of studies that really go into the efficacy of a uh, no-fault injunctive relief, as well as the, the fact that it does not in any way undermine free expression or net neutrality. So I think that is something that will be important for the U.S. to consider. And I, I know that they are considering it because they, they, they have had that hearing to see if that is something that is an additional tool um, that the U.S. now needs to employ after having all of the, the, the evidence and studies that have been d done in those 60 countries that employ it today. Karen, you mentioned the uh, multiple partnerships that you've had, including 
uh, payment processors, search engines, relationships with law enforcement systems, uh, receiving criminal referrals, uh, working with Special 301 um, and implementing trade initiatives with respect to combating and dealing with uh, piracy. And I know that we also learned a little bit more about the Alliance for Creativity and Entertainment. For those who may not understand, how was it established and what are ways that the MPA and ACE are working together to continuously maintain those partnerships? And you, you, you actually discussed it, so I'm not sure if you're willing to share more about it, but uh, we'd love to dig in a little bit more. If- well, yeah, just I guess briefly, I would say that it was established in, I think, about 2017. And so it came out of the kind of recognition that although obviously the MP, the six MPA studios have a significant amount of resources and can on their own fight piracy, that the more resources that you have and the more global context that you have, the more effective that you can be in combating piracy, because obviously it is a huge issue. And so we started off with the six MPA studios plus Amazon studios. So it was kind of the first non-MPA studio to be a senior, so to speak, member of ACE. And now it has grown to nearly 60 different companies who are participants in ACE. We have a lot of companies who are not in the United States now. So a lot of local partners that are regularly joining ACE to help us with the fight against online piracy. And it's really helpful to have those local companies, not only when we're going into local law enforcement, but really to be able to understand what are the issues in those particular regions and in those particular countries and fighting piracy together in a collaborative way. We had mentioned earlier that we have a staff of nearly 100 employees, primarily investigators who are located around the world who are constantly online doing research in terms of investigations for against specific pirated pirate targets. So it, I think it's something that is continuing to grow in addition to having a number of additional and new local companies join ACE. We're also expanding on some of the types of piracy that we are focused on. Sports piracy has become something that is really exploded exploding in a negative way and so we have been we have created itself a a really focused uh, kind of group to address sports related piracy and are getting in sports companies not only our own companies and studios who distribute uh, various sports content but other sports leagues to join us in efforts to go after sports related piracy so I think ACE is is going to be an organization that's just going to continue to grow both in its global footprint and in its expertise in areas like sports-related piracy. Going back, you mentioned no-fault injunctive relief as something that Congress was open to considering. There have also been efforts in the past to stop online piracy. There was a Stop Online Piracy Act back in 2012, which failed to pass. And since then, there has been this back and forth between free expression and First Amendment concerns and these more vigorous laws. What do you think should be done to reconcile the First Amendment with stopping online piracy? Yeah, I mean, I think the movie industry is one of the biggest protectors of the First Amendment. We have aggressively protected the or discussed in multiple venues the importance of the First Amendment for us as an industry in terms of against censorship and things like that. So we recognize the importance of the First Amendment. At the same time, of course, illegal content is not protected by the First Amendment. So there has to be a balance between ensuring that legitimate content does not get in any way targeted or or affected by whatever provisions that are out there, but recognizing at the same time that illegal content actually is not protected by the First Amendment and undermines the First Amendment rights uh, of those creators who are trying to ensure that their creative content is out there and protected. I think when it comes to issues like no-fault injunctive relief, that's why it's important to make sure that it is uh, there is a balance and that there are provisions that ensure that there are due process provisions incorporated into any uh, type of legislation. I think the controversy in 2012 was largely because there was not a lot of experience with respect to these types of provisions. There was an ability to make blanket statements like, what's going to kill the internet, which is not true because the internet still operates. And so I think now we do have a lot of specific data on these types of provisions because we have 60 countries who are 
who have various legislation. So we know how to ensure that the provisions are narrowly tailored, that the provisions respect due process, do not undermine legitimate content. And so I think that as we have that conversation, we can now take some of the data that has been developed with the other 60 countries that have been doing this for nearly a dozen years to ensure that our provisions in the United States are appropriately balanced. And I think the fact that even the proponents of the of legislation of this nature, the movie industry and others, recognize and say that, 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 that this is an important, critical aspect of any provision that due process and First Amendment are key, I think should give great comfort to those who are suddenly are thinking that this may be just trying to kind of rush through something that was controversial in the past, because I think we recognize and value those, the importance of, again, free expression and those issues. But we know that we can value those issues and fight piracy at the same time. And that's really what we're trying to do with some of those types of new legislative tools. Switching slightly into more about the impact of being able to serve the public with respect to their knowing their rights with respect to free expression and fighting piracy on a global scale of we want to first congratulate you on your recent board appointment to join the Institute of the Intellectual Property and Social Justice Organization, which helps to promote social justice issues and intellectual property. How do you think intellectual property can be used to empower those who are marginalized and underrepresented? with respect to IP representation to promote social justice, especially with respect to understanding their rights under the First Amendment and also just combating, combating piracy issues? Yeah, no, I was really pleased to be asked to join the board of the IPSJ, Intellectual Property and Social Justice. It's something that I've always been interested in and I was able to work a lot with them when I was head of the Copyright Office, we had a discussion about social justice and copyright. When I was there, a public discussion on issue. And I think that sometimes copyright has a bad name. People kind of see it more as a restrictive, something that's restrictive. It's preventing you from doing certain things. But if you really look at the copyright system, it is, especially from the creative creator perspective, it is a system that really allows kind of equalization, so to speak, of all creators, because this is something that you are able to do, not necessarily requiring a specific degree or specific training. Artists sometimes are really just artists because they are art. They have that artistic ability. Right. And so it allows a person to be able to use their own intellectual property, their own intellect to be able to generate income and a career that doesn't necessarily require, as I said, a huge, uh, certainly artists are training themselves all the time, but it doesn't require you to, to have to go to a very expensive college or it doesn't require you to have to have a certain background. People from all sorts of backgrounds can become artists and become creators. And so I think seeing copyright law from that perspective as something that will allow people from marginalized communities who might not have the access to certain educational opportunities, but still have that core spark of creativity to develop as an artist, I think is something, and, and, and make a career out of it, is just a huge benefit to not only mar the marginalized communities themselves, but to the public who can get more information can be touched by and influenced by the marginalized communities and being able to get their art out there. And so that's why I think it's really important to think of copyright law not as a restrictive issue, but more as a positive and empowering framework that allows people to just take their brains and use their brains to be creators and artists and actually make money and make a career out of it. As a as a leader in the copyright space and as the most senior African-American executive at the MPA, how does this impact copyright law as a whole? And how can others visualize their potential for important leadership positions in the legal profession? I do think that the statistics are they are they say tell the story in terms of both the government and private sector, the, the fact that uh, women and minorities are underrepresented senior leadership 
leadership roles in both the government and in the private sector. So certainly I think more still con- it continues to be, needs to be done to address these issues. And I think that if you look at copyright law as a social justice issue, then it's important that there are copyright lawyers who also look at copyright law as a social justice issue and that there's diversity in the, in the profession so that they there's diversity and inclusion both at the creator side, but also at the protector side or those who are developing those laws and who are representing the creators and the artists in space. And so I think that just more, as we've talked about, and as I think many people have talked about in the past, more needs to be done just to ensure that there is a pipeline of individuals in the legal field who are pursuing copyright, trademark, and patents, and that they continue to get opportunities to have senior leadership positions that will help to, again, not only diversify the legal industry, but will help the, the creators and artists themselves as well. I think a creator or artist who had, is able to have a lawyer who looks at copyright law through a social justice view, who shares some of their own cultural background, is, can often make that marginalized creator feel more comfortable in that specific space in terms of the IP space and 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 having IP as a career. So it's just important to have more and more voices and more types of voices at every level of the industry. You've had an incredible career in so many different areas. You've set policy, you've been in government, you've worked in-house, and you've been at a law firm. Through all of that, what is one of the greatest lessons that you've learned in your legal career? And what lesson could a copyright or IP lawyer take away from that? I would say in general, I think for all lawyers, but especially for women and minority law lawyers, one of the lessons I've learned is to know your value. I think that once you know your own value and you recognize your own value, you'll be able to determine your, for yourself whether certain opportunities and positions are right for you and when it may be time to move on. So I think sometimes there's a, everyone has a feeling, even myself, of imposter syndrome as a woman or as a minority. And so I think it's recognizing your own value and you seeing yourself as valuable allows you to, again, develop your career in a way that says this particular opportunity is for me and is going to help me. Or maybe it sounds like a great opportunity, but it's, or maybe I'm in a position that is look great on paper, but, you know, because maybe the partic- the particular office or the particular person that you're dealing with doesn't value you, you're able to say, even though it looks great on paper, this opportunity is not for me. Maybe I should go somewhere else where I will be valued. So I think knowing your value is just important and kind of letting go of that imposter syndrome. I would say for IP and copyright lawyers, more specifically, I think it's never start stop learning. Even though I ran the U.S. Copyright Office, I still personally have to continually read and study new developments because the copyright law is always changing. Before it was the Internet and we didn't know what was happening and new types of uh, rules were being enacted by Congress to address the Internet. New decisions were coming down from the Supreme Court to uh, address the Internet. I think we see a similar thing with AI, where there are more than 20 cases right now, I think, on AI and copyright. The Copyright Office is doing right now a very significant study on a number of issues. And so as a lawyer in this space, you can never just say, hey, I'm to reach this certain position and certain pinnacle, I don't need to study anymore. I don't need to learn anymore. You always, I think, will have to just continue to learn. And that's what makes, I think, being a copyright lawyer so exciting, that no matter how much you think, there will always be a new case or a new development that you will have to learn about. And that makes it every day a new day as a copyright lawyer. I'm just curious, like in knowing your value, which was such a really great point, what is it for you that you recognize is if there's an opportunity, what about that opportunity calls to you to say that this is worth, this, if I consider myself value, this is what I, I, I think is worth me or my time? Yeah, I think, I think as a younger lawyer, you might be for, more focused on compensation and just the money side of things. <laughs> um, I certainly understand somebody who was paying my law school loans off until um, very late in my in my um, uh, career, but I think as you get older, you recognize oh, some of the intangible aspects of a position are even more important. Both the environment, because you're going to spend most of your time <laughs> at a an office, 
but also the opportunities for mentorship, the opportunities to develop relationships with your boss. I talk to a lot of young lawyers about wanting to have mentors. And I will say my first and best mentors are my bosses, people that I work with. And so going to an opportunity where you think that you will have somebody who is going to not only care about you as a professional kind of in your professional capacity, but also kind of care about you as a person and care about your career growth uh, and support you even after you might leave that position. I think is something that is really important. And so you might say, I'm going to take a job that is making less money than I did. I've done that several times in my career, less money than what I'm doing now, because I see that opportunity. There's a skill set that I think that I want to learn from that job where there are people there that I really want to work with. And then you'll say, okay, even if I'm, the compensation right now is not quite where I want it to be, I know I, I do know my value and I know that I will, I'm going to be developing a skill set or developing a relationship that overall is going to help me in my overall career. You mentioned such a recurring theme with respect to learning new developments and being able to be strategic about seeking the right opportunities. And often as a general counsel that involve taking strategic risks in your everyday role, how have you been able to learn to embrace such risks while balancing the interests of your company? Yeah, I mean, I do think it is having confidence in your own dis decision making because everything as we deal with as lawyers, there's going to be risks. There's often not clear cut yes and no black and white answers. And so you just have to have, I think, confidence because you know that one, you know your value, but two, also that you continue to keep learning that you have that ability to make a decision and to be comfortable with that decision. I think it's also, of course, though, having willingness to adjust your decision or position when you're confronted with new data that you might not have known about. So being able to say, not only do I have confidence, but not having overconfidence that I'm only going to be right or I'm always right, but being able to take information from your colleagues, that's new information to say, that, again, say that actually does adjust my thoughts on a particular way I'd said that I wanted to go. Um, and I'm going to kind of now de deviate a little bit and being comfortable with that saying, well, yes, it's not that I was wrong, but I now have more information and I'm going to update uh, my decision making to reflect that information. And so having confidence um, in, in actually changing your mind, um, but also doing it from a, I think, place of data and analysis, as opposed to just changing your mind to change your mind. Incredible. Tomorrow is World Intellectual Property Day, which is also known as the World IP Day. And we're curious as to what you'll be doing to celebrate this momentous occasion. World IP Day is the fav my favorite day of the year. <laughs> right, lawyer. I have... Good answer. I mean, it, it's, no, it's not necessarily the favorite day of my year, Mike. But it is for a copyright law lawyer, a, a great day. <laughs> the, the, around the world, you'll always have a bunch of uh, different things that are occurring. Um, always great presentations, conferences often um, take place uh, around World IP Day. Uh, and it's really just, uh, I think, a great opportunity to reflect how important creativity is to our overall society. This year, we're actually at the MPA and ACE launching on World IP Day our content protection blog, Alliance in Action. So I've done a blog post, the intro blog post, which really does talk about some of the things that we talked about here in terms of piracy, the economic harms of piracy and why it's in, content protection is uh, very important for creators and, and, and artists. So I hope everyone uh, goes over to our ACE website for World IP Day and reads and passes on our upcoming blog that will be, be launched on World IP Day. That's incredible. Congratulations. Sure. Um, well... Karen, we've really enjoyed this conversation. Just before we go, what's you know next for you and, and the MPA this year? Are there any projects or initiatives you're particularly excited about? We talked a little bit about ACE and the growth of ACE. And so I, I, I'm really excited about the continued expansion of ACE, getting more members, especially global members. We, we file more cases probably overseas right now than we do in, in the United States. And so it's really just exciting being able to work with companies from all over the world who have the same mission in terms of protection. 
content protection and creators and just hear from them, their individual stories. I will be going to Mexico and to meet with our team in Mexico, meet with some of the members that we have in Mexico and the Latin America region. And so it's just great to be able to continually grow and expand our global footprint. So I'm looking forward to doing that over the course of the next year, expanding again our focus on sports piracy, which is an increasing issue, as I mentioned earlier. So really just excited for the new year in terms of growth and expansion. Karen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New York City Bar Association podcast. Opinions expressed are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the city bar. If you enjoy this podcast, please like and subscribe wherever you listen. Find more City Bar podcasts on Apple, Spotify, YouTube Music, iHeart, or at our website at www.nycbar.org slash podcasts. Be sure to check out This Lawyer's Life, a professional development podcast where we talk with lawyers about seizing opportunities, learning lessons the hard way, and about what makes them tick. And don't miss Building Belonging, a podcast that embraces authentic conversations about DEIB solutions by amplifying the most marginalized voices in the legal industry and exploring spaces others dare not. This podcast was produced by Theodore Florent and Jose Landivar and edited by Eli Cohen.